All right. Have you sent the requisite email? All right. I can hardly wait. All right. Wow, that worked remarkably well. Well, I can understand why you that Works way too well. That is like the best. It's, it's essentially the only close air support weapon in our arsenal right now. And anybody that thinks that the, that's what the Apache helicopter is, is, how shall we put it, mistaken. Yes. Oh, speaking of Apache helicopters, I spoke with a guy that he was in Army Aviation. And he was a Kiowa pilot. I said, well, why is that? And he said, well, we're the guys have to go up because, they, because the package is so expensive they end up kept back. And what, what I do is I have to go up and illuminate the target the laser. Then I call it the fire. Okay, and I said, uh, I remember that being all that uh, armor. He said, no. No, it's just a plain old helicopter with a big radar bubble up above the rotor. Well, actually, there's two bombs there. There's the spot, which is that guy. And then there are the attack helicopters, which are set up there. They're not yeah. all the same. Even though there are, there's firepower on that same thing, but it's meant to actually cover a given area. So it's Well, anyway, for those of you that are interested, uh, I recommend Google and just look at the uh, A-10 Thunderbolt or Warthog as it has become known. I don't know. It's, it's alleged that this is an ugly aircraft. I don't, it looks pretty to me. <laughs> and I'm sure that if I were one of the ground pounders being supported with... Uh, with this aircraft, I would say, oh man, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And this is the gun. This is the main gun from the Warthog. It's a GAU-8 Avenger. It is a honking big gun. Witness the uh, full-size Volkswagen Beetle for comparison. It can throw a whole lot of nastiness downrange. And uh, anyway, 
So to read the, the top line there, it says, blah, blah, Apache helicopters suck. Blah, blah, Captain Kim Campbell. Blah, blah, distinguished flying cross with valor. Air medal and so on. So uh, send me an email if you want a copy of, of my uh, rather brief diatribe. And I will happily send it to you. So it says here that we're going to talk about some stuff. Is anybody interested in leading the charge to have a, uh, a table at Maker Faire? I'll take that as a no, which is all to the good because it's already probably a little late in the game. I think that the thing to do is think about it for next year and think that the day that they announce, okay, it's open, we got to get our, our, we have to be ready to submit. Yeah. I'm sorry. Well, if you go to the Maker Fair, you should be thinking about things that we could be doing in, in the 2016 Maker Fair. Yeah. So that's your job for us. Go to the Maker Fair or look at whatever material is available online if you cannot make it to Maker Fair and think that what we could do to be as good as the best other booth of our sort uh, at the show this year and we're hoping for ideas and we're hoping for some enthusiasm and we're hoping that uh, somebody will uh, will lead the charge uh, and what we can do to, to make that all happen between now and uh, what a year and a half unfortunately I'll be out of town <laughs> for the Maker Fair, and the next Maker Fair as well. So before the break, we were talking about the TI computer. So those of you at home, I recommend you look at XKCD for 1996. Uh, no, it's XKD number 768, and the title is 1996. And it compares the cost of a TI computer uh, graphing calculator with uh, the current cost, uh, technology that's essentially unchanged since, uh, wow, a decade ago. Amazing. Yeah. No? I think that they sort of improved about a decade ago. Yeah, the case became more. Well, all right. But at one time, there was like a development resource kit that you could uh, write some assembly language or I think some C and link to their libraries. And, you know, there were calls for the keyboard and calls for the display. And you could write your own stuff. You could write applications for this. And it was pre pretty egalitarian. As I recall, it was free, you know, as long as you had the, the development tools, the assembler, or whatever. So anyway, if you're interested in stuff like that, have a look at it. There's also a number of simulators some of them you have to have an actual calculator and use your cable to get your PC to download an image of the calculator to run on your PC. And years ago I did that and I guess it's not on this one. It was on the one that crashed before uh, before this one. 
and uh, I wasn't prepared to reconstitute applications at the time. So what else did I say we'd blather about? Okay. If anybody wants to participate in a online discussion at two, now might be a good time to send an email to me or to the email list. And we'll try and get you invited to our share uh, on Google Hangouts so that you can actually send as well as view. Uh, if you don't have the requisite uh, application loaded to participate in the Hangout, now might be a good time to look into that. Hopefully uh, we'll get something going at 2, but if I don't hear from anybody, it might be a, a, a time to turn the Hangout off, maybe watch a couple of videos, and then uh, break early. So that's the plan, such as it is. Uh, why don't we take a short break and Sam can plug his machine in and we'll be all set to go in a couple of minutes.
uh, has bars. Cool. Um, so my name is Sam Falvo. For those who don't know, odds are likely if you're watching this video, you already know who I am and what I'm about to talk about. I'm going to give yet another update on the Kestrel computer and its evolution. Um, just a very quick recap. The Kestrel 2 was a 16-bit base design uh, built around a MISC architecture. The current Kestrel that I'm working on is a 64-bit design built around a open source RISC architecture. Now, because of the difference in architectures, I have to go and redesign uh, all, of the all of the tooling uh, to build the system software for it from the ground up. Everything is, is, has to be redone. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, the, um, in, in the process of doing that, you can come up with some very simple milestones. Like the first milestone that I wanted to, to produce uh, was I wanted to be able to sit on the couch next to my wife while coding Kestrel stuff and she's watching TV. That would be the ideal situation. Um, and in order to get to, to that point, I obviously need a Kestrel emulator. And in order to know if the emulator is working, I need to be able to run a program. And in order to run a program, I need to have the assembler tools for it at the very least. So the question is, how do I know that the assembler is, is operating correctly? Well, now I need to come up with a very simple program that does something simple and stupid, but yet utterly predictable, such as dump the letter A to the screen repeatedly. Um, and from that, you know, this is basically the emulator equivalent of blinking an LED. Um, that's how you know that the emulator is alive, you're interpreting instructions, and that your assembler is producing, at least for this complexity of program, correct code. Um, now, you may notice that the screen here is blank. It's because I had one of my pet cats decide to use my office for something of a personal nature. So. Uh, I don't have any of my notes, so I'm just going to wing it as best I can. And I apologize in advance. Um, because I don't have a slide deck uh, prepared, I'm going to draw graphs on the screen uh, in real time. And uh, hopefully this camera will be able to, uh, uh, to see things. If not, I will save the pictures and I will upload them separately. That being said, um, about that program that dumps the letter A. So how am I going to do this? The emulator is bare bones. It basically is, will, or it's not, I haven't even written it yet basically, but it will execute instructions and it doesn't even accept input from user keyboard, um, but it, it has to be able to produce output. And the way that I'm going to do that is I declare an arbitrary memory location to be the output port of a hypothetical UART, some kind of device, virtual device that emulates an RS-232 interface. Uh, it's not a real interface, of course. My digital uh, FPGA board doesn't have any such interface on it. That's not true. It does. My PC doesn't have any such interface for it, So, and I don't particularly feel like going out and buying any extra hardware. So. Um, but this is, so this will be an emulator only thing. It's basically, its purpose in life is to tell me that the emulator is working. But where in the world do I put it in the memory map of this computer? Because remember, I've got a 64-bit address space. So I could either pack everything into low memory, or I can pack everything in, up into high memory. You know, there's a range. I could use individual address bits as individual device selects. There's all sorts of different uh, ways that I could do this. And unfortunately, I spent probably way too long thinking about this. And it got me thinking, OK, well, how can I, um, how, can, how will the, the memory map of the computer evolve over time? Because I, once I come to a decision, I certainly don't want to have to go back and revisit that decision unless it's absolutely necessary. So the approach that I came up with was there are two things that you can do to manipulate the memory map. One is you can add more RAM, or two you, is you can add more I.O. devices. And there are several ways of doing the latter, typically by way of an expansion backplane. So that got me wondering, OK, well, 
if let's propose for sake of argument that I have a backplane, what is the simplest possible backplane architecture that I can implement that A, lets me retain the property of having automatic configuration support, but at the same time, B, completely supporting a incredibly dumb peripheral, like just a handful of gates wired into, into the bus. And I came up with a solution that I'm pretty, pretty satisfied with, um, and it borrows heavily from the new bus uh, architecture, believe it or not. Uh, it is geographically addressed, and this will be the part where I start drawing happy pictures. This is where I go, go all Bob Ross on everybody. So let's say for sake of argument that this box represents all 64 bits of the address space. And I'm just kind of eyeballing it here, but uh, uh, why didn't that work? Here. There we go. So we have these uh, slices that are built. This will be easier. We have these slices that comprise the global address space. And these are happy little slices. I'll say I didn't warn you. Okay, so we have we have our, our rough sketch of, of the address space. There are 16 bands here, which is convenient because the lots of FPGAs have built-in support for one of 16 decoders. Um, and also lots of discrete components, if you are so inclined, have uh, support for one of 16 decoders. So the top nibble of the address de determines which one of these bands you're addressing, of course. Um, what I do, uh, what I've done is I will put, since the, since the CPU will boot our, uh, either with all bits high or all bits low, I define, oh, come on, why didn't that work? Thank you. Um, I define this as the current device. And you'll notice that both the top and the bottom refer to the same device. And again, this is because the top most, you know, as far as the, the backplane is concerned, we don't know if we're booting with a 65816 processor or a power PC. We have no idea if we're booting with x86, etc. So basically, all we know is that either all the top bits will be zeros, or all the top bits will be ones. So we're going to map whatever device is booting onto both of those both of those slices. That leaves all of these inter, uh, intermediate uh, memory slices available for expansion devices. If you were to to physically build this expansion chassis, <clears throat> now. How does a device know where it sits in this memory map? And this is where the new bus influence comes in. On the expansion backplane itself, there are four pins that are hardwired to one of, in this case, 14 values. And this is called device ID. Um, it's also known as a, geo, uh, a geophysical address, I believe. And uh, so I'm just going to arbitrarily say that um, Actually, I can just do this. So I'm just going to arbitrarily say that this is actually sitting in slot one. <clears throat> so basically, the same this board's memory space will appear in three different spots in according to this device's uh, processor or set of processors, as the case may be. Now, as it happens, um, because this is a 64-bit address space, each slice gets approximately 1.8 times 10 to the 18th bytes of memory space. So about 1.8 billion gigabytes. That's a lot of address space. I don't have to worry about wasting memory space. 
Um, also, because each device is already pretty much pre-decoded based on those four address bits uh, or the device ID, um, <clears throat> any waste that I have is constrained to that one, that one slot. So that kind of frees me up and I'm thinking to myself, okay, um, so this determines, this actually puts a constraint, if you will, on where I can put the UART in this virtual environment that I'm kind of creating. In particular, um, it's got to be within that, that space. Now, because I have so much memory left over, we can actually repeat this process where instead of current device, we use the next four bits in the address to select a thing on your expansion card. So you've got room for 14 expansion cards, and on each expansion card, you've basically got 16 types of resources that, at your disposal. So you've got ROM, you've got RAM, you have any number of different I.O. devices, um, and sometimes you can support mezzanine cards and stuff like that if you want to go the VME bus route. And when you do that, and you realize that each one of these slices has 67 million gigabytes of space available to it, you realize, you know what? Even if I max out the RAM, it's going to cost me hundreds of thousands of dollars to be able to get 67 million gigabytes of RAM, even assuming I had the ability to pack it on the board. I don't really care um, which, you know, how much space I, I waste for IO devices. So what I did was I said, okay, well, in the, in the case of the RISC-V architecture, it boots low. So, they're, they're, so it'll, it'll start booting in this region of memory. Then I figure the next region up will be RAM. And then starting from the uh, top down are the emulator-only resources. So from the very top, that's where I'll place the UART. So this is a very long-winded way of determining where to put this uh, this fake UART. So basically anything that actually goes into the FPGA will start at the bottom and work its way up. Anything that's purely emulator will go from the top and work its way down. And that way there, as, as time moves on and I actually enhance the hardware, um, when, those, when those two meet, that's when I know that it's time to rewrite the emulator. And that way there, I leverage as for as long as possible uh, my emulator software at the same time as emu uh, leveraging how the hardware works. So that's a pretty long-winded way of coming up at the address of, of a UART. So the next step is actually to get an assembler working, which brings me to my next update concerning the Kestrel. Um, originally, when I first tried to write an assembler, it was a single-pass assembler by which I went over the input uh, source listing, and as tokens were recognized, I would emit binary directly. Um, <clears throat> sometimes I would need to go back and patch the emitted binary, uh, particularly for symbols which were not yet defined. And that works great as long as you have one type of re relocation record on hand. If you are implementing instructions on the, on the low risk, I'm sorry, not low risk, the uh, risk five architecture, um, which does extend to low risk, but I'll get to low risk in a bit. Um, if you do that, you'll notice that there are at least six types of relocations that you have available to you. You have immediate type, there, there's five types of actual instructions. Do you have the, the I, the R, the U, the S, S, B, and U, J, I'm sorry, six types. And then there's the seventh type, which is uh, just pure absolute address uh, for things like just laying down random words into the assembly listing. So when you record a fix up, you have to record not only where it is, but also what kind it is. And this cross cutting of, of this cross cutting of uh, concerns greatly complicated the one pass assembler beyond a level that I was comfortable with. So I kind of threw it out and started working on a machine fourth uh, implementation. As I was doing that though, I came across an, another project which uh, actually is a two kilobyte 
symbolic two-pass assembler for the 6502. And looking at that source listing gave me an idea for how to implement a proper two-pass assembler for the RISC-V architecture. So I'm currently working on that right now. Um, I hope to have something to show within a month or two. Um, that's basically where I'm at with that right now. The way that it would work is you, you maintain a buffer in memory as you go through the source listing and you record how to interpret the instruction that you're currently trying to assemble. So this is your first pass. Basically pass one, a lot of people say, oh, well, the first pass is coming up with, um, uh, with addresses for symbols and then the second pass you go through the listing again and reassemble it as though it were a one pass assembler. And that is, I can tell you with some authority, that is the wrong way to go about doing it. What you actually wanna do is use a buffer that records what you want to do. And the reason this is important is because as your, uh, there's expressions that you can use in an assembly listing that can be fairly complex. For example, I can load a register with, with a hardware value, and if I wanna set some bits and reset other bits in the same expression, um, you know, I would typically do an and or uh, set of instructions, and then I would save it. And in the and, and in the or expression, you can have bit one or bit two or bit three. You know, you can have these arbitrary complex logical operations. Uh, similarly, you can do bit shifts, uh, in fact, anding and bit shifting combined is pretty much how you use or, or set bit fields in assembly listings. So, but if you don't know the values that you want to use in these expressions, you somehow have to record that. And so if you're just recording the instructions that you want to assemble, that's not enough data. So again, you want to be able to use these buffers um, to hold not just the fact that you're assembling a, a load instruction, but also any of the arbitrary uh, expressions that you uh, pass on to it um, for operand evaluation. So what you're doing in pass one is you're planning, is really what you're doing. You're planning how to go about you know, creating the binary. Then in pass two, you simply execute this program that you've built. And the structure that I've come up with is actually brain dead simple. I mean, I'm, I'm not entirely sure why I didn't see it before. Um, so let's see here. Basically what you have is So you have this um, an execution token for um, an operation. Oh, come on, stop, stop, stop. Let's do this. And you have, you know, and as, as you go along, you build up this, basically a, a, a sequential listing of uh, things that you wanna do. now. Sometimes you might want data, but instead of it being prefixed, so for example, if I want to reference, um, if I want to reference the name of a symbol, this would be xt to look up symbol name. Then this would have to be, of course, the name of the symbol, right? And then these operations are, are whatever follows through. Now, the way I'm encoding it in the buffer is basically a packed array of bytes. So the execution token is laid out as a set of four bytes. That way there, everything is nice and compact. It doesn't have to be that way. It just is an artifact of how the software is built out of convenience. Um, but as you go through and you take in and you assemble, uh, this arbitrary long assembly listing, this buffer, of course, grows, and you only append to it. You never go back and you fix it because that kind of defeats the purpose of having a multi-pass assembler. So you're building up this intermediate representation. It happens to be linear. 
Now, most, and I think this is a good way of determining, is it an assembler or is it a compiler? If it's an assembler, your list will be, well, a list, right? Your intermediate representation will be linear. If it's a compiler, that implies greater structure, greater, greater amount of syntax, then you tend to resort to an abstract syntax tree. So this intermediate representation um, is then uh, very easy to go through and execute. You basically, you have a pointer that points to one of these things, and you look at this execution token and you say, okay, jump to this routine. Now that routine will consume, is responsible for parsing ahead. It's responsible for parsing this name and then leaving the pointer pointing at the next execution token. So basically, pass two of this assembler is not much more sophisticated than your typical fourth interpreter. Fetch, execute, fetch, execute, fetch, execute. That's all it does until the very last uh, line of input will cause the execution token that, to, that says this is the end to be placed into that list, and that is the very last thing to execute. So that's how I'm planning on building the two-pass assembler. Um, I have a crude prototype that I wrote in, uh, in Go uh, up online on my uh, GitHub account, but um, I'm actually attempting to rewrite that into a proper assembler in fourth. The reason why I'm rewriting it in fourth is because I want the assembler to work not only on my Linux environment, but also once I get STS working under the new uh, uh, Kestrel, I also want it to work on the Kestrel as well. And it's much easier to port forth than it is to port Go, which is because you need to port C first. So yeah, you're basically porting two compilers if you want to port Go. So yeah, you have to port C and make sure that it's uh, code generation is correct. Then you have to port Go and make sure that Go's code generation is correct because Go is a proper compiler as well. Yeah, so I, what's that? Yeah, double the work, exactly. And it's, it's the same thing too if you wanted to do like porting Python or uh, uh, porting, you know, Ruby, you know, you have to you have to do these multiple layers. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to write it in fourth um, as inconvenient as it is because you have to deal with files and you know system interfaces and stuff like that. Um, it's I think it'll be easier in the long run because just getting forth working on, on the cache rule will be um, a one step process instead of a two or three step process. So so that's that's the plan. That's where I'm at. I hope that I'm sorry. Oh yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, and you know, sometimes it pays to study older architectures, you know. Um, in this case, Nubus, the Nubus inspired architecture is perfect for, for the Kestrel. Now, am I actually gonna build this expansion backplane? Probably not, but when you look at it, it gives me room to grow in case I do want to do it. And the cost of that is is negligible. I could change the you know the memory map pretty much any way I want. Um, I could say, you know. I reserve four slots for, you know, for the new bus stuff, and the rest of it's all PCI. If I want to adopt PCI, you know. Well, the, the, the addressing model will allow 67 million gigabytes of that on just the one board, right? right? So, um, and that's, that's one slot of one device. So if we can, you know, if you want, you can do the full 64-bit, you know, memory capacity, but you'd need to have, or at least need to emulate multiple, multiple slots. So the, what I call a slot is like a PCI card, like something that plugs into a backplane, right? So just to just to be clear. Right, right, yeah. Whereas whereas in this case, that still applies, but one step in, one nibble in to the address in the address space. 
the uh, the uh, the first nibble in the address determines the actual physical plane plane slot, and then the next nibble in is is uh, devices on the board, and then anything after that is, you know, whatever you want it to be. Um, so yeah, that's kind of that's kind of how I'm architecting that. Um, I am actually surprisingly on time. So one of the things that I wanted to bring up, I mentioned low risk. And low risk is a, an attempt, it's another project that uses the risk five architecture, or uh, instruction set architecture. And they're, they have much bigger resources than I do, as you can see here. They've got access to a fab, um, and they are talking about producing actual silicon. Uh, and they're very much aware of green arrays. So you'll notice what I wanted to talk about here was the distinction between these minions and these RISC-V architecture processors here. And it's actually structured like a typical mainframe. And by, ma by a typical mainframe, I'm talking an IBM System 390 architecture system, not even 370. So what you have is you have this centralized cluster symmetric multiprocessing capable batch of processors that are out of order, super scalar, all the, all the gee whiz buzzwords that, that you typically see associated with the Pentium processor. Um, and these are designed for high throughput computing. These are the cores that you would use to do to implement neural networks or Fourier transforms or something along those lines because these are your numerical, these are your number crunches. These, which use the same instruction set, have a different model. They are single issue, at least the, the one that I, uh, the paper that I saw, they may change this. Um, but the ones that I saw was single issue in order and with a very predictable timing model. And what, what these processors do is they connect to a collection of dumb but reusable components whereby if you want to implement a UART, you can do so in software. You have access to shift registers of programmable size and, and direction. Um, you have access to low-level parallel I.O. And probably not much more than that. Just very, very thin veneer of, of services above raw, you know, raw transistors on, 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 a, on an I.O. pin. And these minions can then be programmed to do RS-232, to do SPI. Um, they I remember, I can't find a resource right now, but I remember reading that they had plans to implement Ethernet. Um, now, these cores are obviously much bigger, much more complicated, and much more sophisticated than the green arrays cores are. But it's the same concept. Software-defined I.O. And doing so at an acceptable clock rate. Um, and you'll notice that this connects to the rest of the bus via an I.O. network. I haven't read the full details on this yet, but I do believe that includes DMA, which means that your main processing cores can send an instruction by way of a message to one of these minion cores, and then the minion just takes over. It's like, oh, you want to send a string out to a UART? OK, just give me the address, give me the length and I'll do it. And it'll go there and it'll, it'll pick up bytes from memory and it'll actually serialize it out, out the RS-232 pins. Um, so RISC-V is actually getting to be pretty, pretty significant. It would, it, I actually would be surprised if we went to uh, this year's Maker Faire and did not find a RISC-V booth, at least one RISC-V booth there. So I kind of feel vindicated by selecting RISC-V for the Kestrel. 
Um, the guys that are behind this are actually eyeballing the Kestrel. They're interested. They're interested. Um, the person slash people, well, I have a confirmed email contact from the people, from the brainiac, if you will, behind the RISC-V architecture. He's interested in the Kestrel. He wants to see where I'm going to take it. And it is entirely possible that we may see a Kestrel at some point in the future that uses a low risk chip instead of an FPGA based processor. And if that's the case, you'll see clock rates and instruction rates go jump from 50 MIPS to million or to a uh, thousand MIPS because that I believe the core that they're talking about for this particular chip is about one gigahertz. This is uh, this chip will be fabbed, I believe, in. 45 nanometer process and they're talking about talking about roughly one one gigahertz CPU clock rate and it's all open and by which I mean all open I'm talking right down to the hardware description language this is an open source chip the instruction set is all open source everything about it the coherent network the IO network the use of the minions the definition of the cache all of that stuff's all open source. It's actually under BSD license. That's entirely possible. That is actually entirely possible. I don't know because I don't have working Kestrel implementation yet, but uh, I do know. Uh, I do know that FPGAs draw a lot more power than dedicated silicon. Um, so for an equivalent core, I'm pretty sure that I will draw much more power than, uh, than an equivalent core in, in raw silicon. That said, there's in this diagram, at least five CPUs <laughs> plus the cache. So who knows how much, you know, in, in reality, who knows how much actual difference in power draw it'll be. Yes. Sort of just assume all the gates are running to the extent possible, otherwise it will melt. Yeah, that, so that's, that's true. That's actually. Yeah, which which I am right now, but you know, like I said, without actually knowing how much it takes. Yeah. Okay, that's a good rule of thumb. So I, I would have to I would have to look at the data sheet. So I, and and it's all on die. So. It, <clears throat> Oh, you you can well since it since it's all on die, it would have to be on the data sheet that you would know. Right. No, this no because all all of these CPUs all touch all touch memory, so these these minions actually have their own program. So you basically, so what you're doing when you boot the chip is you program those chips or you program those minions, not in, in a way, not entirely dissimilar to the green arrays, how you would do it with a green arrays chip, where you feed it actual program content and you bring up the minions. Once you have the minions up, then you can bring up the software here and it, and it all goes. Look at the data sheet. I mean, I'm sure I'm sure that they're going to have a range. I know that I know that one page, 144, but there's only a, there's only a limited number of of I/O pins, right? So so your I/O limited on that. Whereas here, all of your cores, they're bigger cores than the green arrays by far. 
right? I mean, we're talking at least 32-bit CPUs here. And God only knows how many kilobytes of memory available. Um, but, and also the IO shim that they're talking about here is um, switched on a bus. So basically you can have, and this is my understanding as it is today, documentation, I'm sure things will change over time. My current understanding is that the minions can, any minion can touch any IO pin because, it, because there's a switching network, not entirely unlike an FPGA in that matrix up there. So, <clears throat> so basically, I think one, one document that I read said that there were, that one of the first versions of this chip is going to be eight minions. So you can have up to eight, uh, eight IO devices, basically. And as far as like programmable timers and things like that, things, um, things of that nature, you can actually get away with having fewer of those because it's actually part of the RISC-V instruction set architecture that the CPU itself has a countdown timer as part of a standard set of peripherals. And the reason, the original reason for that is to support multitasking, like in a Unix-based operating system. But if you're using this for like IO, since these are all RISC-V, basically if you have eight peripherals, you essentially have eight, uh, eight timers at your disposal as well. So. But yeah, that's kind of interesting. Um, some people are doing some interesting things uh, with the RISC-V architecture, and I feel vindicated going with it. So I'm pretty happy. <laughs> so cool. Um, my time, oh, look at that. I'm four minutes early. Any other questions? Yes. Um, it's documented on their on their paper. Um, they act, they actually reference uh, green arrays as um, uh, like a as an endnote, like a bibliograph thing, and they reference the F18A uh, data sheet. So. Yeah, yeah, it, it totally caught me by surprise because I didn't expect because like when I first looked at minions, I like the first thing I was like. Oh, have you checked out green arrays? And then it's like I'm looking through their literature, and it's like, oh, yes, you have. <laughs> <clears throat> they are, if nothing else, quite thorough in their research. What's the name of this company? Um, this is called Low Risk. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's a kind of a pun it's of a name. A it's more of a, yeah, it's more of a group. A, the the person behind it actually is quite active in the Raspberry Pi community. And he's kind of leveraging that, that position to be able to do, as he describes it, the Raspberry Pi for homebrew tankers, basically. So he's looking for an architecture that is not, the reason he went with RISC-V is because he wasn't happy with Broadcom um, for, uh, uh, for their ARM processor. And this actually is another point too. Um, God, I'm gonna butcher his name. Um, Kirsten, uh, I want to say I want to say his name is Kirsten or Kirsten or something like that. He's he's the guy who basically is currently heading up the Risk Five project at UC Berkeley, and I apologize for for destroying your name, um, <clears throat> but he has um, he conducted an experiment with a forty five nanometer uh, process chip with a comparable set of peripherals compared to an ARM chip of that same process and, and manufacturing date. I think it was like an ARM7 of, of some variety. The difference was that the RISC-V architecture was 64-bit and the ARM processor was 32. The RISC-V processor drew less power and was faster than the ARM chip. Now, the differences were you might say noise, at least in the terms of performance, the power was more significant. The fact that, you know, it drew, you know, a couple of milliwatts less than the arm for basically twice the information bandwidth because you're dealing with 64-bit and it has floating point. 
and it has floating point on top of that, right? So, so you're drawing like all this power, the same amount of power as the arm, but you've got all these extra transistors, you have the bigger cache, you've got, you know, the same clock speed, everything. More bandwidth, yeah. So I think it'll be for a next generation Raspberry Pi, I think. Purely based on my, like, the fact that you have a level two cache with a memory controller and all this other stuff attached, it's almost certainly going to be like a pin grid array, which is itself not going to be very hobby friendly. But what I predict that they're going to do is they're going to have a board roughly the size of a Raspberry Pi. It's going to be smack in the middle, and they're going to try to market it like an Arduino. That's that's going to be that's my prediction. I don't I don't. Yeah, a very high end Arduino. But they're looking at, you know, and they're making a lot of the same claims that Green Arrays was saying, where, um, you know, we do a shuttle run, and for this amount of yield, we'll be able to sell chips at ten bucks a pop. So, the the pricing appears to be silicon limited, not transistor limited. So, um, hopefully, we'll be able to see chips as low as twenty bucks. Yep. Cool. And I'm on time. Despite my cat. Despite my cat. That's right. <sighs> yeah, but I, I would have been. I, I was doing it. I was planning on doing it ignite style, so it's like every every fifteen seconds the slide would have would have moved automatically. So, cool. Um. <laughs> All right. Let's take a short break. Short break. Short break.
Are we still streaming? Yeah, we'll be back with you in uh, a couple of minutes, I think. Uh huh. Yeah, it seems like was it the pace that we had somebody at one uh, one fourth day, maybe five years ago, we had the original author of the Fig Fourth, and also a guy that had built a. He had actual and simulated pace processors, and he had uh, upgraded the Fig Fourth to the. Anybody else remember this, or am I just? No, the pace is a different processor entirely. It has nothing to do with the sixty-eight thousand. The, before the other building was destroyed, yeah. mercilessly eradicated from the face of the earth. Yeah, we were over in Termin at the time. I remember the building. I don't remember the guy. God, we we were over at HP. Now Agilent, part of the building is now Keyens, and there are these guys working on these old NMR machines. They're the service department for these things. And apparently they came from Varian when HP bought that part of Varian. And I swear these guys used to, you know, shoot one-on-one uh, -on -one at lunchtime with uh, Sigurd and Russell and go out for beer with Panofsky. Not to say they're old, but uh, you get the idea. So we're looking a little bit at bit savers. So Dave will put the link from bit savers in the meeting notes. I think he has an email now from the list. Uh, John has sent it to the SVFig list. So interesting stuff. Some of it even has fourth. So you needn't have put the NSF tag on it. But there's a lot of stuff in the uh, BitSavers archive. And 
I guess it's more of a trick finding it than actually. <laughs> well, that's why you use the index. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> yeah, well. But it ends in stuttgart.de. Good night. So, checking my email, I don't see anybody that's terribly interested in participating in an online discussion. If you would like to present to uh, SVFig remotely, please, by all means, drop me a line. Uh, I'd like to talk briefly about what we might do next month. And uh, since nobody is paying attention, hey, Dennis, let's, should we call it a day?
Okay. Yeah. Well, fortunately, we don't pay any attention to Robert's Rules of Order here. No, God, no. God, no. <laughs> that would be wrong. All right, I'm going to turn this off. We're going to say good night. Have a good uh, whatever it is. Please drop us a line. Tell us uh, what you think of the webcast uh, if you are not here physically. Uh, if you want to present, you're strongly encouraged to get in touch with us. Uh, we'd be pleased to hear from you. Uh, and uh, we certainly demonstrated today that a Hangout presentation is, uh, is well within our, uh, our purview. Look out, it's a purview and it's getting larger. And on that cherry uh, note, I bid you uh, a fond uh, good, uh, good afternoon.